We got it. We made it. Uh, hello, Melbourne. Uh, my name is Yash. I'm a senior engineering manager at Alassian. And today I've got my friend Will, who's a principal engineer at the media and attachment platform at Alassian. We are here to share the exciting journey of how we migrated a massive 40 petabytes of data across Alassian platforms and hopefully share some learnings that you can take away from the session. So for folks who are not aware of Alossian, we create software for teams. We believe in unleashing potential of every team. You might have used our flagship product, Jira and Confluence. I would highly recommend to look at our other uh, line of products that help you plan and deliver your work better. So let me set some context. This 40 petabytes that we are talking about is classified as transactional data. It's the kind of data that you'd interact with when using our products, and you would typically have a millisecond or a subsecond latency expectation when working with this type of data. Unlike your analytical data, where you are running queries for getting insights, and it's not really a hard requirement to have a millisecond latency expectation there. So the two key differences I like to say is 40 petabytes for analytics platform might be okay, that's fine, depending on how large your companies or how much data you produce. 40 petabytes of transactional data is amazingly huge and an outlier. The second thing is when you're dealing with anything transactional data or migration, it's table stakes that the system is operational and online. You cannot expect to have a downtime or degradation in user experience because there are actual customers using your product while you're playing or touching this sort of data. Right. So, what is an expectation from a system, storage system to be specific, that's holding or serving this kind of data? So, data is money, and I like this joke, a storage platform is not very different from a bank. So, you, you're putting your money in the bank, you don't want it to just disappear, you want it to be there, table stakes. Your, your money is not getting lost, your money is not getting corrupted. You'd expect a high privacy and security expectation from the bank. You don't want others to know about your bank balance or even worse, access your bank balance. Um, you would want to get the money out reliably. You would don't want the bank to say, oh, no, we can't give you your money today, but you can have it tomorrow. Uh, you want reliable access to getting your data out and possibly really fast. You, you don't want to be waiting in a queue or very long for getting access to your own data money. It'd be really silly if the bank did not scale, like, hey, I've got a million dollars, oh, we can't take a million dollars because, you know, we cannot support that scale. You would want the bank or the system to scale elastically as you bring in more data to the system. And finally, you'll probably expect some cost efficiency out of the system, uh, which would be your savings. And what does Alassian expect from a system? There's some business-specific expectation. So Alassian has got Six, more than 60 petabytes of media and attachment data, which we classified as transactional data here, and more than one petabyte of product data. This is something like your ticket description, your conference page content. These are not really attachment, but these are the core experiences that you have when using the product. We've got terabytes of configuration data and machine learning models that are again powering the experiences that you have while using the product. And a lot, most of Alassian platforms are multi-tenanted. It's just a way of sharing the underlying resources so that the platform can be cost-optimized rather than dedicated infrastructure, which becomes very expensive on a Alassian scale. And finally, enterprise readiness and compliance is what gives Alassian an edge over the competitors and gives assurance to our customers. So Alassian is constantly looking at new regulations or compliance that are coming in and we try to ship them or bake in the product as fast as we can, it gives customer trust that their data is safe, not being misused, not mishandled. With that, I'd like to introduce transactional data platform. It's a storage platform that we have built in Alossian. 
to be able to solve these challenges that I just mentioned or these expectations that I just mentioned. On a high level, what does transactional platform give to our Alassian? The transaction data platform is an internal platform. It's, we have not exposed it as an offering to end customers. It's something that our services and products would use internally. So what do we give them? On high level, four things. We give managed data storage, so they don't have to fiddle around, provision their own resources, or optimize them. We will take care of managing the storage, optimizing it, scaling it, and providing it as a service to our um, Alaskan services. We are on top of implementing compliance in one single point, which means any service that onboards to us gets it for free. There's no extra effort required or think about compliance. They just want to care about their own business logic and specific use cases. We try to make some cost optimization over native S3 and DynamoDB. We know certain nature of the data, and we can, and being multi-talented nature, we can optimize on top of what S3 or DynamoDB would give us, and in future more data stores as well. For now, we are focusing on S3 and DynamoDB. And finally, it's elastic. So as as we are adding more customers, more companies on the platform, and as we are adding more products via acquisition or any other mechanism, the platform is elastic to be able to support more heavier workloads. Quick peek onto what a Lawson ecosystem looks like and how TDP fits in the bigger picture of things. So our foundational layer is AWS. That's where all of our resources lie. That's our preferred cloud vendor solution. We have our PaaS layer on top of AWS that takes care of provisioning and managing resource lifecycle. We've got various different platforms for logging, monitoring, and alerting, vendors, in-house, a bunch of different platforms that we use. We've got our own uh, internal rate limiter implementation that is, again, a platform component that all of the platforms leverage is a line of defense for noisy neighbors or sudden spike in traffic or um, you know abuse of the system. Finally, we have got a tenant provisioning and life cycle platform, which is really cool. It's one centralized place where we track any workflow or life cycle changes on the product. For example, if your site admin decides to move your site from Germany to Australia, this is the first point where we would detect that action. And this, across various different Alaskan platforms, will alert all the responsible platform that touch or host any data that is that needs to be compliant. You know, move my data to Australia, for example. So this having this decision made at a centralized point makes it really scalable to create more platforms that can take action, but don't have to bother about every product's specific way of migrating region or handling data. So it decouples that, which gives us a really good productivity boost on being able to create more platforms. TDP sits on top of the PaaS and is currently offering binary and entity storage. Binary storage under the hoods is Amazon S3. Entity storage under the hoods is DynamoDB. We are exploring, so these are all data planes, this control plane. We are expanding into more data planes as there is a business need that emerges in. So more recently, we are exploring relational storage as an expansion to our data planes. And finally, the products sit on top of TDP, making using TDP as a black box storage platform for their needs. So you might ask, why migrate? Like if, if various teams have got data in their own systems, what's wrong with it? Uh, anytime we have to look at the data, audit it, Anytime a new compliance comes in, we are talking about 200 different microservices with their own data sets. It is crazy unoptimized to be able to make even simple fixes because the data is just distributed across systems. The other thing is, anytime a compliance comes in, it takes one to two quarters to implement the compliance control. It gets multiplied by the 200 services that we are talking about. So it's a massive sync of productivity for the company, just being able to deliver something very simple or trivial optimization. Finally, if you're able to bring all the data in one place, it gives us massive, not only visibility in terms of audit, but a massive control on making optimization on the data sets. For example, we introduced compression, and now all the services integrated with us have got it for free, and every 
service reduce their overall cost, and Alasan got a huge benefit out of that. So it just makes it easy to introduce new optimizations, just having it all in one place. That's bring, that brings us to the most exciting part of the talk, and the and the learnings on what we how we executed this migration. I'll pass it on to Will to take it up from here. Okay, thanks, Josh. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a principal engineer at Atlassian in the media and attachment platform. Uh, I'll start by introducing the media and attachment platform a little bit. I'm going to call it MAP occasionally as well, or media. They're all the same thing. Uh, media and attachment platform deals with every single file or attachment uploaded across Atlassian's cloud product suite. So anytime you're uploading a file in Jira or Confluence or Bitbucket, it's going through the media and attachment platform. Uh, on top of that, we also handle front-end experiences. So we, we, when you play a video, when you play an audio file, when you view an image, when you view a document, that's the media and attachment platform again. Okay. Uh, similar to TDP, we are built for enterprise readiness. We have multiple uh, certifications and standards that we adhere to. And we also operate at the full scale of Atlassian. So we're dealing with hundreds of terabytes of data on a daily basis. I'm going to skip through this one real quick. It's very similar to the TDP one. We sit between the Atlassian PaaS system and our products. The difference between MAP and TDP is that we do have that contact with the end user. So what are we doing? It sounds very simple. We're moving that arrow there, over there. Right? Yep. Very simple. So today I'd like to share with you the challenges associated with moving 40 terabytes of data from that one spot in S3 across to TDP as our primary data store. So the first challenge is quite obviously 40 terabytes, petabytes, sorry, not terabytes. It's a big difference. Uh, 40 petabytes of data is huge. So to put that in context, 40 petabytes of data is approximately 191 AWS snowballs. Or if you took 40,000 one terabyte hard drives and stacked them on top of each other, that'd be about one kilometer tall. Okay, that's about 200 meters taller than the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Okay. Now, clearly moving this much data is going to take a long time. Now, we spoke before, this is transactional data. There is an expectation that it's always available, and it's available fast. So we can't have any downtime or data loss while we're moving this data. And on top of that, we're seeing about 25% increase or growth of that data year on year. So we have got new data coming in all at the same time. So how do we solve this problem? We took a phased approach to changing our primary data store from our self-managed S3 bucket into TDP. So there's three phases, three high-level phases. The first phase is just to introduce, introduce TDP as a data store. So we start writing data to TDP. At this particular point in time, we've got an opportunity to check that the response we're getting from TDP is exactly the same as we're getting from S3. So it's sort of like the scientist pattern at play here. So we can monitor everything. Once we're happy that TDP is giving us the same response we're getting from S3, we can move on to the next phase. This is where we stop writing data to our own S3 bucket, and we're only writing new data to TDP. So all, data is being, all new data has been written to TDP and read from TDP, but old data has been read from S3. At this point, we can start backfilling the data from S3 into TDP. The final phase, which can only happen once we've backfilled all that data and verified that we've copied it across with no data loss, is to stop, write, stop reading from our S3 bucket entirely. And at that point, we're completely on TDP. So that's our first challenge. The next challenge is arguably the most important. We don't want to lose any data. One of the values that are last in it is don't fuck the customer. Right? So we can't have any data loss at all. Right? 
This is a little bit complicated, so bear with me. We took a three-pronged approach to ensuring that we had no data loss. The first step was when we were copying a file from S3 to TDP, so at the file level. We make, first of all, we make sure that it copies successfully into TDP by verifying its checksum. We update the file metadata to say that it's in TDP, put a TDP ID on it, say it's copied. We do that for every file. Then we'd have another pass over all the files again to verify that we've actually done what we said we would do in the first step. We check that it's got a TDP ID, check that its status is set to copy, and also then do a head request into TDP to say, is the file there? At that point, and only at that point, are we happy to say that TDP is the primary data source for that particular tenant. The final phase is the deletion of the data. And this is the most sensitive one, of course. We would basically repeat the verification phase for every file before we deleted it. Then we delete the file. But not just that, the, the deletion is a soft deletion. So we delete it, soft delete it for 30 days, and then we'd hard delete it. Now, we still have backups if anything goes wrong, so nothing ever gets lost. Right. Moving on to our next challenge. This is a bit unobvious and a little bit specific to how our systems are architected. ALBs are very expensive, particularly when you are transitioning 40 petabytes of data through multiple ALBs. Each ALB acts as a cost multiplier. So some context. If we take the naive approach of streaming 40 petabytes of data through from S3, uh, S3 bucket through the map systems, into TDP, we'd be transitioning multiple ALBs. So how do we sort that out? We went with pre-signed URLs. So in this scenario, MAP would generate a pre-signed URL from S3 and hand that to TDP. TDP can then pull the data out of our S3 bucket directly into TDP, bypassing lots of ALBs. When we implemented this, we saw a 20% reduction in the, the uh, projected costs of the backfill, as well as seeing up to five times faster data transfers, depending on the type of data. Another learning we had is that latency from cross-region calls makes things slow. When it takes longer for our customers to get their data, it makes us sad. So to explain this a little bit more, MAP traditionally has been deployed alongside its storage in every single region that we exist in, which is about 15 regions. With the introduction of TDP, uh, we could start introducing cross-region latency because TDP doesn't exist in the same regions that Media does. Media is one of the older platforms within Atlassian. So we exist in some old regions that we're no longer deploying stuff into. This, of course, has two impacts. The first impact is latency due to the cross-region call, which is around about 25 milliseconds or so. And then cost. So each cross-region latency, the cross-region call has an additional cost. So we solve this by introducing a content delivery network doesn't eliminate the problem completely, but it means that instead of having millions of requests incurring that additional latency and cost, we have one. The first request incurs that cost, and every subsequent request is fast and cheap. I'm just going to finish up quickly and talk a little bit about how we kept track of everything while this migration was happening. We had about a dozen 
half a dozen to a dozen different dashboards monitoring about 50 plus metrics across 15 different regions. Everything from worker node health, CPU and memory, hard disk usage, to number of nodes, through to the latency customers were experiencing due to this new process, through to the reliability of the backfill, through the amount of data we're transferring, and the cost. So we have a lot of data coming through. That's it. I'll hand it back to Yash to finish off. Yeah. To summarize uh, the adventure, um, the migration was executed with zero downtime and zero, lo zero data loss. So all of your data is safe and secure. You can all have a sign of relief there. Um, we were able to get to four nines of reliability. That is in amazingly high bar for the for an operation like at this scale. We observed 20% saving just by standardizing the usage of S3 and DynamoDB. We are not even talking about optimizations here. Every team was using the systems differently, and that was costing us 20% more. Just being able to standardize in one particular pattern got us 20% of saving. We are going to do more on top of that. Compression, intelligent tiering, and uh, compacting objects or stitching objects together. There, there are a lot of uh, optimizations on S3 where if an object is below a certain size, it is not making the best use of the platform. Start stitching them, and you'll see some productivity or cost gains there. Similar for cold tier data, most of the systems, the data is outdated. It's an attachment that you uploaded quite back is not as used. So there's a lot of optimization you can do just by cold tier handling of the data. Finally, Every team takes one to two quarters for one compliance control, and Alasan is working on like seven or eight different compliance controls. So a massive dev productivity boost. We have onboarded 45 services right now. So 45 services into two dev quarters were like a direct development efficiency we got for the company there. It's amazing. That's that's all the learnings we had to share with you folks. Hope hope you'll take some, you know, have some takeaways. Um, Alasan is hiring. Please have a look at our career site if you want to work with amazing engineers like Will. And I've got some stickers outside. If they're still available, grab some of Alasin's sticker. Please, a big round of applause to Yash Sharma and Will Falkner. Not only a great presentation, but also worked through some technical nuances. Thanks very much for that.